I think we can all agree middle school isn't the greatest time of our lives. With so many changes within yourself and others, it can get a bit crazy trying to figure out who you are and who you want to be. Not to mention trying to figure out what others are like. But let's stop and just think about what you said to your friend or even a stranger last week. Was it mean or nice? Did you think twice or never look back? Everyone is guilty of this, including myself. Everyone goes through this tough time called middle school, but does it really give us the right to say cool things? This project was created to show what we say and what other adults of higher authority might think of it. I have kept a journal over the past couple of weeks, writing what I have heard my peers say and what maybe I have said in the past. It opened my eyes. We need to start being nicer to each other. It doesn't matter the race, gender, sexual identity, size, or ethnicity. We also have to stand up for each other and pick each other up when one falls down. As you watch this video, think about how you can improve your behavior and help people around you. That is what I am trying to do, and I know you can do it too. My name is Ken Cumby. I'm the rector at St. Luke's Episcopal Church and School. I'm Anthony Capps, and I'm a math teacher um, for the state of Alabama. I'm Brooke Eubanks, and I'm a dance education teacher in Laurel, Mississippi. I am Joelle Lewis Billingsley, and I'm a professor, assistant professor at the University of South Alabama in the College of Education. Carol Dodge, and I'm a former superintendent of Mobile County Schools. And I was a department chair at South. I teach leadership, school finance, or masters, and then teach a couple doctorate level classes. I did most of my growing up here in Mobile. I went to elementary school and, uh, and, and high school here. And when I was a young adult, I had the opportunity to leave Mobile and spent about 20 or 25 years living in other parts of the country and then uh, about 20 years ago, came back to Mobile. So I grew up in Pensacola, Florida um, for most of my childhood until eighth grade. And uh, my mom and I moved around a lot. So um, my grandparents uh, helped put me in a private school so that whenever we moved, um, I didn't have to move schools every time. I could just stay in one school. So I grew up with like 14 kids in my class in uh, kindergarten through sixth grade. And those kids became like brothers and sisters to me. And uh, we had one black kid, uh, Brian, and uh, he was one of my best friends. Like we learned how to swim together and all that kind of stuff. Um, but he was the only exposure to diversity that I had. <laughs> I grew up here in Mobile. I, my f our first home, so I have two older siblings. And so our first home was on Dauphin Island Parkway. And I went to... Maryville Elementary, and then my father got a job at Kimberly Clark Paper Mill, and we moved to I grew West up in Portsmouth, Virginia, uh, which is, for the geography, right next to Virginia Beach. Uh, went to school there, went to Old Dominion undergraduate, which has now gotten bigger and bigger. Uh, my uh, master's is from Old Dominion, my doctorate's from Virginia Tech. I believe that the neighborhood we live in, the city that we live in, on the one hand, gives us perhaps a lot of love and support, but the thing that was missing in my own upbringing was an opportunity to be around other people and other ideas. So yeah, I think that growing up, uh, like depending on where you grew up, has a huge impact on things. So I moved to Alberta, Alabama, um, I had I was in um, the private school with 14 kids from K through 6th grade. And 7th and 8th grade, I went to a public school for the first time because we thought we were moving to Delaware. And I wanted to like see what public school is like before we moved. And uh, there were 1,500 kids in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. So like 500 kids um, to 14 kids was a huge difference, and I loved every second of it. 
because it's super diverse and all of a sudden I was like not the best at like the sports teams or you know like <laughs> all that kind of stuff I was definitely the low man on the totem pole mm -hmm. and I just got to see like oh my god you can do anything um whenever you're one of so many there's so many opportunities that are available for you because they have to cater to so many different people's interests and talents everything we hear everything we see impacts who we are and how we see things and our perspectives doesn't mean that's the only point of reference for how we feel, how we feel, how we see things, how we view the world, but it's definitely really important because it's part of who we are. So our interactions with people and our environments really make a difference in, in determining our perspectives. Southerners tend to be very gracious, that uh, they say a lot of things like, you know, how are you or how's your mother? They don't really care, but they ask. Uh, I worked in the Midwest as a superintendent for five years, and they tend to be a little bit more direct. You know, they will walk into your office, for example, and just basically say, I have a problem, and this is what it is. Uh, that they tend in the Midwest to, to have public debate a little bit more about questions. The school system I worked in was a very progressive school system, but there was always public debate. But when they made a decision, they moved forward. I mean, for example, Well, middle school was awful. I think that uh, there's a universal kind of, of angst about being 12, 13, or 14 years old, 11, 12, that kind of thing. So certainly uh, I experienced the kinds of adolescent uh, upheavals uh, emotionally and physically that other middle schoolers experience. I don't recall when I was in middle school hearing these kinds of what I refer to as ugly name calling and prejudices to the extent that we hear today. There was certainly a lot of racial slurs. I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood, a white part of Mobile, and uh, we made uh, enemies out of those people of color, and along with that were uh, all sorts of racial slurs and prejudices that I learned from adults. So middle school was a huge transition, I think, for me. Partly because, you know, it's a new school and people you don't know, you're kind of growing up. And uh, I went to Azalea Road Middle School, which I think now is Denton Middle School. And um, very close to my home, I would say less than five miles from my home. And I remember it being sort of tough, you know, um, trying to make new friends and trying to be a good student at the same time. So I remember middle school being a time where I was trying to figure out who my friends were and figuring out, you know, the type of friend I was and all those kinds of things and learning about boys and, um, you know, who likes who and passing notes, trying not to get in trouble. I just remember a whole lot of a lot of chaos in middle school. Yes, I was a. I had almost two thousand students. Um, um, our middle school then was called junior high, and it was grade seven through nine. So the ninth grade was a different breed. Um, I don't know if they were better, you know, than say six through eight. I don't know which one I liked. Ninth grade seemed to be removed from seven and eight. The language and whatever was yes. Our my middle school was about. About 50-50 racial. Uh, the interesting part is that there was no middle class. It was a very, very affluent neighborhood, 50%, and a very poor neighborhood, 50%. What I really mean by that is that within the two different groups, there was always a subculture of bad language. My quote, inner city kids. Uh, they, they would go through our middle school for three years, and I never knew their real name. I knew their nickname, you know, there was, I can still remember them, you know, I remember a whole clan of ducks, we called them. 
big duck, ugly duck, you know, white duck, the yellow duck, they all had their names. And then I get, again got them in high school and stuck with them. But there was there were certain things and certain words that were used sometimes. Now, whether we like that or not, whether we did something about it's another story. Well, my first inclination would be to express to my child a deep disappointment, uh, a sadness that she would think these things or say these things ab about another human being. I would share that disappointment and my, my hurt and then I would want to have a conversation. I would want to hear more about how she could come to those conclusions. And who influenced her? I would like to know if she is thinking critically or not. Is she really thinking and coming to a conclusion or is she following along with peer pressure and are these sort of emotional responses? Is she fearful of that which she doesn't understand? So I'd like to have those kinds of conversations. I feel like it's always good to be self-conscious of you know, how you're raising somebody or the influences you have on children. And I think I would. I think I would say, you know, what have I said in the past? What have I done that could have possibly spark this, but I don't think that if you, I mean, if, if you believe a certain way and you know that you're raising your children up the way that they should be and how they should think and be open-minded to everybody and accept and love everybody, then I don't, I don't think anybody needs to dwell on that. Now, if you know for a fact that, I mean, if I know I've made a joke and not even thinking, you know, people do that or, um, say if my husband had made a joke about it made a racial slur or something that just being funny, then I would definitely be considerate of that and, you know, try to fix myself in those parenting ways. But I think that you have to look at all aspects of what that child is around and, you know, who who the influence are. Are there the teachers, the um the students that they're around? I would I just I feel like talking to your kids and having a discussion and being open with them and and allowing them to be open with you like not you know not letting them be afraid to open up to you as a parent I feel like that's the most important thing in situations like this because then they'll be honest yeah like as a I'm a teacher as well so uh, in my classroom um, I try to promote a culture of valuing mistakes and uh, and I also really believe that reflection is important and I hope that um, in my family structure that I get to create one day um, there will be a super strong sense of team um, a super strong sense of the mistakes you make are also part of me and the mistakes that I make are also part of you so um, as we reflect on that, like mm -hmm. together, as we reflect on our own contributions to whatever's happened, um, that culture of valuing the mistake as a learning opportunity, and then talking together about how can we as a team move forward, whether it's uh, me being more careful about the jokes that I say or the things that I have on TV that mm -hmm. promote those insensitivities or the culture that I um, encourage you to be part of. Uh, whether it's exclusive or inclusive, whether it's uh, hateful or loving, um, those kind of things I think are really important to look at as parents and teachers and community. I don't have any children, but if I, and I'm always skeptical about saying what I would do because I don't have any, but mm -hmm. I, I think I would be really extremely disappointed. My hope is that I would raise them in a way where they would not say those things. I, I do understand that there's a element of like you don't know what your child will do but my hope is that the things that I would instill in them about you know treating others as you would want to be treated and loving other people as yourself I think I would want them to default to that 
I would sit down and ask him about the appropriateness of it. More, more importantly, I'd ask him, what if, what if the tables are turned? Right? You just picked this shy girl or whatever, and you made some innuendo that's totally inappropriate. Let's turn it around. What if your brothers and sisters called you this? Well, you know, in the answer, of course, I'd almost anticipate, well, I wouldn't put up with it. I, well, when you deal it out, or the old saying about the right to swing your arms stops where the other guy's nose begins. So usually I'll try to talk with them about it. On the one hand, I'm not surprised. On the other hand, I am I'm deeply, deeply disturbed. I am not surprised because I think that we have seen an upheaval in, in this kind of, of hate, this kind of uh, prejudice and misunderstanding, closed-mindedness. I'm not surprised. Children and teenagers uh, learn this from other adults. That is the trajectory in terms of what I see, what I hear, is not going in an upward trend. Like it's not necessarily getting better, which means it's most likely getting worse. So how is it that we can help young people feel better about themselves so they won't put others down? And how can we help others defend themselves when you have people who are bullying them like that? I think we have to really rally around it because ultimately these young people are gonna grow up and they're gonna be adults. They have to be in the workplace and have to interact with other people and have to, you know, raise other raise their families and then how can we like stop that? And I think we as a community we really need to think about how we can do that because the tragedy is on both ends and especially if nothing happens to both of those individuals in terms of like creating some empathy and creating strength and how can we do that? So they won't they won't be adults doing yeah. the same thing. Well, I think a certain portion of it, the, the the badgering back and forth has always been there, a certain portion. But there's always some reasonable limit. I am shocked now because I'm semi retired. I probably watch more T V than I ever did. But I, sometimes between music and and what kids are allowed to watch. Um, on Xfinity and whatever, because you can get anything or, or any game, but the language is there, becomes the norm, which is acceptable. Um, even with my own kids, a couple times I'd hear a word fly out of their mouth sometimes and ask, whoa, whoa, wh where'd this come from? Oh, Dad, I'm really sorry. I, I was upstairs watching something I wasn't thinking, and I brought a different language home. Uh, and, and I would almost explain to them, we all have different languages. You have a language you use among your girlfriends. You really do. You have a language you use at home with your mom or your dad. You have a language you use if you go to cathedral or church or synagogue or whatever. And, and, and we're constantly moving in and out of those languages. But, but there's a huge influence from the outside. Um, sometimes what I hear, I'm a, I'm a great Saturday Night fan, Saturday Night Live fan. Uh, sometimes what is now being said on Saturday Night Live 10 years ago would have never been accepted. So we're beginning to accept more, that's a worry, as, quote, being okay, or, quote, being, well, that's what everybody else does. You know, if everybody else decides to play in the middle of I-65, it doesn't quite make it right. Well, I have to begin with parents. I believe parents have a tremendous leverage and tremendous um, opportunity to enlighten and to also to teach. Certainly not all parents would teach this kind of behavior, but I do believe that uh, so much of this happens in the home. I think the other possibly is the availability of hearing others uh, by way of uh, perhaps Facebook or other uh, social media uh, outlets and we all know how influencing that can be. 
So children today and teenagers have access to all kinds of, of ideas and influences, and some are very, very helpful. I'm um, brought up the idea that it takes a village to raise a kid. It's not just that yeah. family unit. So uh, It could be anything. And like you said, TV. I mean, right. <laughs> it could be the social yeah. media. I mean, and social media is huge. And that's the issue that when we were in high school and middle school, it wasn't as big of an issue. I mean, these were smaller. Yeah, it's and like, social media wasn't a thing. Like we, I mean, it was just starting, and you know, you couldn't just post anything, and you didn't have. And so, I feel like um, and TV that's a was huge different. Influence. Like what yeah. was allowed on TV is right. very different than what's allowed on TV now. Yeah, for the better and the worse. Yeah, so. I agree. It's everything. Is unhealthy and sad and even tragic at a couple of levels. One, our young men are following the examples of grown men who continue to treat women as objects of sexual gratification. And so there is no imparting of, of dignity to young girls and to women. And so our young men are often following the example, modeling the behavior of grown men who can achieve prominence in our city and state and country and continue to devalue. <laughs> I don't, they're not shocking. I, I mean, and this goes back to the first question that I was at. It's, I feel like it's the area we live in, um, the people that I'm around. I, I hear it often, um, and like I said, not from the school I'm at, but like just in the community and um, places like, you know, just people are very uncomfortable with things that are different from them. And I've learned that, I mean, like I said earlier, I was brought up in a household where yes this was this was going around or going on around me but I was not I was taught to be accepting and it was never an issue that this person was different so they're bad it was ne I was never taught that but so but now that I am I'm more I'm more aware of it and I'm in communities that do think that way I realize that they people are afraid of being different or people are things afraid of things that are different from them and they are not willing to they're not willing to try to accept it they're not willing to yes, no I think the quotes are shocking because I wish it didn't happen but not shocking because I've heard it before so I would say that I see the things that you said that were being said that you reported. I would say that I, I hear that on television all the time, you know, or I see it on social media all the time where people are saying these types of things. So it's like a reflection. I think that statements are not shocking because they're a reflection of our culture and our society, but it, it's disappointing that we're at a place where that's reached our young people and that uh, in some cases being tolerated. The problem, I believe it begins early in childhood. Uh, it can be corrected. It, it can turn in, in another direction. And um, but I believe that it is a social and, and institutional problem. Parents have to be a part of the solution. Places of worship must be part of the solution. And men and women who hold positions of authority in schools, in government, must be held to accountability and must model uh, positive uh, values for the sake of our younger children. And you, know, uh, you have to be, 
you have to be open-minded yourself to be able to change your views like that. And um, I feel like the more that we promote diversity and we get it, we get it out there. Things like this, like things like what you're doing, talking about it, um, showing whether it is TV or social media that you know these you know people aren't bad for feeling differently or thinking differently, um, and it's okay that you know it's just people need to see that and people need to experience it and. A lot of people just have it, and they stay stuck in that way because that's all they. That's all. I think we can make things better. I always think we can make things better, and I think it starts with saying, "This is not right. I don't agree with it." And I think the next thing we do is we figure out the best way to confront it, you know, and still be true to ourselves. So I mean, what I mean by that is. How can I help the situation and still be true to what I believe in my values without being sucked in and becoming the very thing that I think um, doesn't represent who I am? And so I think that's another thing we can do. I think that's individual. But I still think when, when other students go after it and go, we're against it, it's uncool, that student's isolated. And that's where you want that idiot. That's probably the nicest term I'm going to use on your take. That's where you want the idiot. You want him isolated. Um, I remember a, a baseball coach did something that was real interesting that, that worked for me one time. He was pretty renowned for having great teams. And he brought a special ed kid that was severely special ed, but he was his bat boy. What happened was, the kids that would say something ugly to this special child during the day didn't happen anymore because if they turned around 12 really bad guys who played baseball who were really macho and could, quote, clean their clock in about 30 seconds, suddenly stepped up. So the image of that special kid sort of changed because he, he was protected. He was a protected class, if that makes sense. Um, I always thought that was interesting. He wasn't a very good bat boy. But he was there and he was very, very We proud. are afforded the opportunity to have different kinds of experiences with different kinds of people. When we open our minds and our hearts to see a truly global community, a global world, people of color, people who do not adhere to my own particular faith perspective. People from other cultures, other languages, other orientations. When children are exposed to that diversity, usually there is an openness and there is an opportunity to celebrate the differences rather than to denigrate and to even demonize. So. Uh, when young people have the opportunity to, to leave their little neighborhood and to explore the world, I believe there's a great advantage to that. And that's at least one way uh, to make that happen. Now that you have watched this film, I hope you took something from it. The smallest kind act can make someone's day. Now please, go out into the world. Have a new outlook on life. Treat people maybe a little bit nicer than usual. Remember, it starts with us, and if that's true, it starts now.